Okay, so now that we've introduced these different types of research designs, let's take a little break, have a little fun with something called the water jug problem. Now, some of you guys may have encountered this um, either in cognitive psychology or any number of other classes. In fact, it's a very common problem in uh, not only applied mathematics, uh, also in computer science, they use it as a, as a standard example um, for writing toy programs to solve the water jug problem. Or you might have even seen it in movies such as Die Hard 3, right? for the, the big Bruce Willis fans out there. But the problem goes something like this. Imagine that what you have are these three different jugs, three different containers, okay, is the way it's typically set up. And there's a number of variations on the problem. We're going to stick with this current example. Okay? You have a 3-gallon, a 5-gallon, and an 8-gallon container. The 8-gallon container is full. And you're with yourself and one other friend. And so what you want to do is be fair and split, evenly divide the 8 gallons of water evenly among you and your friend. So in other words, then, what you want to do is to end up with this 8 gallons evenly divided into two separate containers, each of which contains 4 gallons. Well, of course, if you have a 3-gallon container, that's not going to hold the 4 gallons. So you can already infer that what you're going to want to end up with is 4 gallons in the 5-gallon container and 4 gallons in the 8-gallon container. Well, how are you going to pull that off with just these three different containers, the 8-gallon container of which is full? Now, what I would recommend is maybe pausing this lecture here at a moment, think about it, or if you want, go ahead and look on Wikipedia for the answer, okay? But pause for a minute and really think about how you might be able to solve this problem, and in particular, how many moves you think it might take to solve the problem. So how many moves did it take you? Well, you should have been able to do this in no greater than eight distinct moves, or pours, of one container into another. I'm not going to go through the entire thing here, and I didn't bother to animate all the slides to illustrate the solution here. Okay, But if you think about it, this is a pretty simple, in fact, mathematical problem in terms of how you might go about solving this. Okay. And what it involves is pouring the 8 gallons around into the other different containers and using some of the excess that you have in one container, pouring it back and forth across, of course, the different containers. Okay. Now, what you can do is imagine that you're in a situation where you present people with a problem such as this one. Okay. And then what you want to do is then to see how well they do on some other problem. Maybe what you would introduce is some sort of experimental manipulation that you think is going to increase people's problem-solving ability. And again, you could say that it's going to be something like the presence of caffeine or some other drug. Okay? You could say that it is a, um, um, a special concentration or breathing technique. Okay? Or it might even just be something as, as direct and simple as an instructional manipulation that instructs people on the underlying mathematics by which they're solving the problem. Or conversely, you may think about some manipulation that you think is going to hinder people's problem-solving abilities, such as putting them under some sort of pressure. Now, whatever the case may be, let's assume that we have some experimental manipulation that we think is going to affect, for greater or for worse, problem-solving ability. Well, regardless of exactly what your manipulation is, let's assume that we have some experimental manipulation that we're interested in seeing its effect on problem-solving ability. Now, as we talked about in the previous set of lectures, one very powerful design in order to look at any sort of experimental manipulation, or quasi-experimental manipulation, is a pretest-post-test design. Now, what this is going to allow you to do is to equate your groups, even if you're using a random assignment. Using a pretest, then, as we've determined, allows you to establish that the groups are, in fact, equal. In this case, equal in problem-solving ability or reasoning ability before your manipulation. Now, what if you use the water jug problem as your pretest measure? Well, those of you that actually bothered to take a moment and try and solve the problem or discover the solution to the problem, you might feel a little bit wiser, you might feel, in fact, a little bit more adept at solving these types of problems. So the point where I'm going with this is you might have used a pretest in order to conduct a measurement, but one problem with the pretest is it also gives your participants practice with the exact type of task that you want to use as your ultimate post-test measure as well. Let's look at an example of that. Let's look at another problem-solving task okay, as an illustration of, of what may be referred to as this pretest priming. You guys might have seen a task similar to this one as well. So the situation goes like this. You're on one side of a river, and you've got a boat. You're a farmer, whatever it is. And what you want to do is you want to get a sheep, a wolf, and a head of lettuce all across the river safely to the other side. Now, the problem is the boat can only fit yourself and one other item in it at the same time. The other problem is 
If you take, for example, let's say that you're going to take um, the head of lettuce across. Well, that'll leave the wolf and the sheep by themselves on the left bank of the river, in which case the wolf is going to eat the sheep. Okay. So when not in your presence, the wolf would eat the sheep. When not in your presence, the sheep would eat the head of lettuce. And so the problem is what you have to do is to take one thing at a time across the river without leaving two items on the same bank that are going to be problematic. So again, what I would encourage you to do is to just take a minute, pause the lecture here, and see if you can think about what would you take across the river and in what order? How would you get all three of these things safely onto the other side? So this one's not quite as time consuming to actually go through and look at the solution. So for those of you that are dying to know, one solution goes as follows. The first thing you would do is to put the sheep into the boat, hop into the boat, and head on over to the other side of the river. Unload the sheep on the other side and come back with the boat. Then what you would do is to then put the wolf into the boat and take yourself and the wolf across the bank to the other side. Now this is okay, even though the wolf and sheep are both over here. You're over here as well, so you're able to keep tabs on the wolf so that he doesn't end up eating the sheep. Now what you do is you come back across the river with the sheep, leaving the wolf on the other side. You trade the sheep for the head of lettuce, leave the sheep on the left side, head back over with the head of lettuce on the other side. You leave the head of lettuce, come back over, and pick up the sheep for your final trip across the river. Now again, notice even though the lettuce and the wolf are on the other side, wolves, as we know, are, are carnivorous. They don't like lettuce. They just like sheep. Okay. So here, in this case, you've managed to get everything across the river. And what you might measure is, for example, somebody's reaction time on a task like this. How long does it take them to solve the problem correctly and get everything over to the other bank of the river without losing sheep or lettuce or anything else? Okay. Now, if that's what you're measuring, this is your dependent variable in which you're interested. This would be your post-test measure of problem-solving ability, the time it takes to correctly solve this problem. Now, the issue here is that just by virtue of having solved that water jug problem, you might have been primed by that pretest measure. And that pretest alone, having engaged in that water jug problem alone, may make you more adept at solving this problem here. Now, then what we have is a little bit of an issue where the pretest was beneficial in making certain that we don't have people who are just better reasoning ability in one of our controller experimental groups. But the problem with giving that pretest is that it's, it's predisposing people to perhaps be better at the task at hand. So that could introduce a potential confound. So again, the one thing this I wanted to, to use an example to do is to illustrate some of the perils with always using a pretest measure. It's not necessarily going to be the case that you're always going to be able to get away with using a pretest measure without any possible negative implications. Well, what do we do about that? Let's think again about the situation we're in. In our experimental group, what we have is random assignment to this group. We have a pretest measure that we're using to make sure that our random assignment has in fact equated something like problem solving ability across our two groups. We introduce some manipulation that we presume is going to increase, let's say, problem solving ability. And then we finally measure our post test measure of problem solving ability, which is the measure of performance in which we're interested. Well, if you think about it then, there are a number of different possible things that could be producing good performance on this post test, the measurement or dependent variable of interest. In other words, there's a number of different possible causal events that's causing people to do better on that post-test, our ultimate measure of performance. The first is the effect of having the pretest that I mentioned before. So pretest priming, by virtue of doing the water jug problem, that alone is going to have some sort of effect on your performance. The second is the effect of, in fact, the treatment in which we're interested. So whatever it is that we uh, are intending to be the thing that, that's causing an improvement in problem solving ability. This is the effect in which we're interested. The third is what's called pretest sensitization. Okay? This is a situation where the effect of the treatment, the effect of our manipulation, is enhanced by virtue of having had the pretest. Now, notice this is a little bit different than the effect of the pretest itself. In the first case, we're talking about pretest priming, where just doing the pretest might make you better at the post-test, for example. Pretest sensitization, on the other hand, 
is where the pretest is going to make your treatment more effective. So if our treatment was, let's say, um, uh, a brief lesson or instructional primer on the underlying mathematics behind, say, the water jug problem, then by having had the water jug problem and having a concrete example to which you can attach that abstract explanation might make that instructional manipulation more effective. So in other words, by virtue of having had that pretest, the instructional manipulation may itself become stronger than it would have been without the pretest. So if you will, this is sort of a combination or interaction between the pretest and the treatment, the first two effects that are listed here. So, of course, we want to know how much of possible improvement or possible performance on the post-test, the reaction time on the river problem, is due to each of these different effects, and in particular, how much of it is due to the treatment in which we're interested. Well, the solution in order to determine how much of the performance is due to each of these different effects is what's referred to as a Solomon design or Solomon four group design. And it goes like the following. In particular, what it involves or requires is to have four distinct groups of people in an experimental setting. The first group is the experimental group that we looked at before. Okay, so all of these groups are going to start with a random assignment. This group receives the pretest, the treatment, and the post test. Now, if you have a second group that is still randomly assigned, they don't receive the pretest. They receive just the treatment and the post test. Well, now look at these first two groups. By comparing these two groups, what is the only difference between group one and group two? The presence of the pretest. So any differences in performance between group one and group two, you can attribute to the only thing that differs between them, that is, the pretest. Now let's add a third group. This group receives the pretest and the post-test, but not the experimental manipulation. Now again, if you think about it, what we can then do is to compare, look at group 1 and group 3. Again, group 1 and group 3 receive the exact same sequence of events except for the experimental manipulation. So now, comparing group 1 and group 3, we're isolating just the experimental manipulation because they both have had the pretest and the post-test. Finally, if we add the fourth group, which receives no pretest, no manipulation, and just the post-test. Then again, what we can do is to look at an appropriate comparison. For example, let's look at comparing group three and group four. Again, these groups are exactly similar, but now these groups haven't had the experimental manipulation. And group four has not had the pretest. So now there's no way that you could have this pretest sensitization effect either. Now it's a little bit more complicated than I've led on here. The bottom line is that by using this complete Solomon four group design, that is by having every possible combination of pretest and or experimental manipulation, then you can do whatever appropriate comparisons are necessary to isolate all of these different possible locus of effects. Now again, I'm not going to go into the details of exactly all the comparisons that would need to be made here because it, it can get a little bit complicated. But hopefully the bottom line here, which you can understand and appreciate, is first of all, given the fact that people are taking a pretest as well as a post-test, there are some potential confounds that are introduced just by nature of having that pretest. The pretest itself, as well as the effect the pretest has on the effectiveness of the manipulation. However, by being careful about including appropriate controls in our study, Okay. in addition to just two different groups, but the four different groups identified here, we can be more systematic is the, is the point here, that we can be very systematic about isolating the different causes or the different loci of these different effects. That's all I want to introduce here, is again to caution some of the of, of what's going on with these pretest and post-test designs by way of a couple of hopefully somewhat interesting examples. At this point you should now be prepared in conjunction with lecture five in the first part of lecture seven here to take the next online quiz before our next class.